Okay, let's continue our discussion of how the retina works. The retinas of vertebrates, animals with backbones like us, consist of two classes of receptors. One is the rods and the other is the cones. The rods are most abundant in the periphery of the retina and they respond better than the cones in low light conditions. The cones, on the other hand, are most abundant in and around the fovea, the center of your field of view, the area with the highest acuity, and you've got about 6 million of these per retina. Unlike the rods, the cones are essential for color vision, and they tend to be more useful in bright light conditions because they're not as sensitive to low levels of light the way the rods are. Here's a rod and a cone. These are artists' representations. This is the outer portion, and this is the inner portion. The inner portion contains the nucleus and some of the other organelles. The outer portion here contains these discs, which in turn contain the photopigments, which as we'll see are crucial for actually transducing light, converting light into changes in the membrane's potential. This is a scanning electron micrograph of an actual human retina, showing you the rods and a cone. Pigments are just chemicals that absorb light. So when your clothes were manufactured, uh, the manufacturers added pigments to the fabrics to change their color. Photopigments in your eye are chemicals contained in the rods and cones that absorb light, just like other pigments, but these pigments release energy when they're struck by light. They kick off a cascade of reactions inside the photoreceptors that change the membrane potential in response to light. The photopigments are composed of 11 cis retinol, a light sensitive molecule that's encased by a protein component called an opsin. These protein components, these opsins, vary from one another. And as a result, different photopigments are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And as we'll see, this is at the heart of our ability to discriminate different colors. So the perception of color is largely dependent upon the wavelength of light. So to understand color perception, first we need to learn a little bit about the physical properties of light. Light itself is just a narrow band within the broader electromagnetic spectrum. And this is showing you the full electromagnetic spectrum plotted in terms of its wavelength in nanometers. So these are very, very small wavelengths. But first, what is wavelength? All regular repeating waveforms have certain ways that you can characterize them. Uh, one is the height or amplitude of the wave from peak to trough. Another is the wavelength, the distance from one peak to the next or from one trough to the next. And of course, different waves have different wavelengths. For sound waves, the wavelength is inversely related to the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the, the more often these peaks occur, the shorter the wavelength and the higher the pitch of the sound. For light, we're not talking about pressure waves in the air, as we are with sound, but rather electromagnetic waves, rapidly changing magnetic fields that propagate out from some source, like a light bulb or like the sun. The sun emits a really wide range of electromagnetic energy, all the way from gamma rays, which have very, very short wavelengths, onto x-rays, ultraviolet rays, and then here this narrow band shows the wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic waves, that our eyes happen to be sensitive to. The range is from about 350 or 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. The wavelengths of light that are visible vary from species to species, depending on the properties of that species receptors. Again, for us, the shortest wavelengths we can perceive are about 400 nanometers. This corresponds roughly to our subjective perception of the color violet. And the longest wavelengths we can perceive are about 700 nanometers. And this would correspond roughly to our perception of the color red. But why is it that we're sensitive to this narrow band of wavelengths? Why not be sensitive to other wavelengths of electromagnetic energy as well? This shows part of the answer. So both of these plots are showing you how opaque the atmosphere is to different wavelengths of electromagnetic energy. 
In other words, it's showing you how much of the electro, how much of the energy at those wavelengths makes it through the Earth's atmosphere to the Earth's surface. You can see here that gamma rays, X-rays, and most ultraviolet rays are blocked completely by the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere is 100% opaque to these wavelengths, so they don't make it down to the Earth's surface. You could potentially have photopigments in your eye that make you sensitive to X-rays or to even gamma rays, but that wouldn't be an advantage. It wouldn't offer any advantage to an organism that had that because there aren't enough electromagnetic waves at those wavelengths to bounce off things and give us information about the environment. In other words, there wouldn't be anything to see. But when you get to the visible spectrum here, you can see there's a dramatic dip in opacity. The atmosphere is mostly transparent to these wavelengths here, what we call visible light. And then there are some peaks and troughs out here in the infrared part of the spectrum. Out here, the long infrared waves are mostly blocked by the atmosphere. And so if you're interested in studying the emissions of these wavelengths from, let's say, stars or planets, you need a telescope out in space to study this. Most radio waves are observable from Earth. And as a result, you can have space observatories like the one in Arecibo here on the surface of the Earth. These large arrays of, of satellite dishes pointed up at the sky that observe radio waves coming from deep in space. But why is it that our eyes aren't sensitive to these radio waves since they're making it down to the Earth's surface? Biophysicists have studied this, and they believe that it would be next to impossible to create a molecule that was sensitive to these very, very long wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, whereas it's relatively easy to make a molecule that's sensitive to light in the visible part of the spectrum. Let's quickly talk a little bit about how we perceive colors on surfaces. An object that appears blue is really just absorbing most of the other wavelengths of light. So here you're seeing red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet light. Now, as we'll see, light itself does not have a color, and objects themselves don't have a color. It turns out color is really your subjective perception. Objects just reflect different wavelengths of light in different amounts. So you can see that an object that appears blue is bouncing back mainly these shorter wavelengths and absorbing the other wavelengths of light. Likewise, an object that appears red is absorbing most of these short and medium wavelengths and just reflecting the long wavelengths. And we tend to perceive an object that does that as red. An object appears black if it's absorbing nearly all the wavelengths of light across the visible spectrum. It's not being shown in this figure, but an object would appear white if it's bouncing back nearly all the light across the visible spectrum. But not all species of animals and insects perceive the same wavelengths of light that we do. This can offer an advantage for some species. For example, this is showing you a black-eyed Susan photographed just under visible light. You can see that the petals of a black-eyed Susan reflect more or less the same amount of visible light along their length. But if you look at the way they reflect ultraviolet light, you see that these wavelengths that our eyes are not sensitive to get reflected in different amounts along the length of the petals. The inner part of the petals absorb a lot of ultraviolet light, and the tips reflect a lot of ultraviolet light. We can't see this difference because our photoreceptors aren't sensitive to ultraviolet light. But many insects can. Butterflies, for instance, or honeybees. This is showing you the sensitivity, the amount of light absorbed, by three different photoreceptor types in honeybees. You can see that honeybees can perceive part of the visible spectrum that we can perceive as well, but they can also perceive quite a bit of light or electromagnetic energy down into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, right down here between 300 and 400 nanometers. So they're perceiving shorter wavelengths of light that we can perceive, and potentially extracting information from the environment that we can't. The bottom line is that the aspects of the environment that a species is sensitive to is driven by what aspects of the environment are biologically relevant for that species. It's crucial for us to understand that discrimination among colors 
being able to tell that one surface is reflecting different wavelengths of light than another depends upon the combination of responses by different neurons in your visual system. And this leads into the two historical interpretations of color vision. For many decades, these were competing explanations of color vision, because each of them explained different properties of color vision. One is the trichromatic theory, also known as the Young-Helmholtz theory after its originators, and the other is the opponent process theory. As we'll see, each of these theories explains aspects of color vision, but they fail to explain all the phenomena that are associated with color vision, as we'll see. Let's start with the trichromatic theory. The word trichromatic refers to three colors. Chroma is color, tri is three, and this theory says that our color perception occurs through the relative rates of response, the ratio of activity, across three kinds of cones. And we do have three cone types. We have short wavelength cones, also called S cones, medium wavelength M cones, and long wavelength L cones. Each of these cones is maximally sensitive to a different set of wavelengths within the visible spectrum. And together, they cover the full visible spectrum. In fact, the reason the visible spectrum is visible is because these three cone types are sensitive to those wavelengths. You can see that short wavelength cones are maximally sensitive to shorter wavelengths of light. Uh, its peak sensitivity is right around 475 nanometers. That's the wavelength of light that these are most sensitive to and they become less and less responsive to longer wavelengths of light until you get out to about 480 or so nanometers, at which point they stop responding. The medium wavelength cones are maximally responsive to light at about 530 nanometers or so. As you get longer or shorter than that, these cones respond less. The long wavelength cones are maximally responsive to wavelengths of light around 520 nanometers. And again, as the wavelength gets longer or shorter, these cones respond less. The trichromatic theory says that it's really the ratio of activity, the relative activity across these three cone types that determines the color that we perceive. A more intense or brighter light would increase the brightness of the color, how bright the color seems, but it wouldn't change the ratio of activity across the three cone types. And as a result, it wouldn't change the perception of the color itself, just its intensity or brightness. Let's say I'm looking at a surface that's bouncing back mainly short wavelengths of light. Let's say right around 425 or 450 nanometers. Under most conditions, we would perceive that as being blue. You can see that the short wavelength cones would be the most activated. The medium and long wavelength cones wouldn't be very active at all because that 420 to 450 nanometer light is barely within the range that these are sensitive to. So you'd have a lot of activity in the short wavelength cone and relatively little for the medium and long. If I were to look at an object that was bouncing back mainly 500 nanometer wavelength light, we would normally perceive this as green. You can see that it would maximally activate the medium wavelength cones. It would hardly activate the short ones at all. And it would also activate the long wavelength cones a little bit, but not as much as the medium wavelength cones. You can see that an object that bounces back 550 nanometer light, what we would normally perceive as something like yellow, would activate the medium and long wavelength cones about the same and not activate the short wavelength cones at all. And finally, a surface that bounced back light between, let's say, 600 and 650 nanometers would activate primarily the long wavelength cones. These would be the most active. The medium wavelength cones would also be somewhat active, but not nearly as much as the longs. And again, the short wavelength cones would be totally inactive. So you could see how the ratio of activity, the relative activity of each of these three cone types kind of tells you where you are along the visible spectrum. The closer you are to the shorter wavelengths, the more this is active. Medium wavelengths activate mostly the medium wavelength cone. 
and long wavelengths activate mainly the long wavelength cones. But what happens in some individuals who can't perceive color normally? These are two plates from a test developed by Shinobu Ishihara, a Japanese ophthalmologist who worked for the Japanese military. And he developed this test to identify individuals with different types of color blindness. Now, the colors here aren't going to be represented exactly the way they would be in the actual plates because those are manufactured with precisely formulated inks, but it gives you a sense of what the test is about. Most people can perceive a number eight right here. Some people don't perceive this part here, but do perceive the three. So you could either see a three or an eight or possibly nothing at all, depending on what type of color vision deficiency you might have. Over here, most people perceive a nine and a six. Some people perceive either the nine or the six uh, or nothing at all, again, depending on what form of color vision deficiency they have. A color vision deficiency is just an impairment in perceiving color differences. It's often referred to as color blindness. But the vast majority of people with color vision deficiency can perceive colors to some degree. It's just that they're impaired in discriminating certain colors. The most common form of color vision deficiency is difficulty distinguishing between reds and greens, between the medium and long wavelengths of light. The most common reason for this is something called dichromatopsia. Most humans are trichromats, meaning that we have three cone types, and therefore three types of photopigments. But some individuals have a mutation in the gene that codes for one of the cone opsins so that they only have two functioning cone opsins instead of three. They might just have short and medium wavelength cones, or they might have short and long wavelength cones. It's usually a problem with the medium or long wavelength cones. So they have a loss of the M or L photopigment gene. Another cause of difficulty distinguishing between reds and greens is called anomalous trichromatopsia. In this case, the mutation isn't so bad that you completely lose the medium or long wavelength cones, but rather they're shifted around so that the medium and long wavelength cones have response properties that are more similar to one another. And so it becomes harder to figure out what wavelength of light you're seeing out in the medium to long wavelength part of the spectrum. This is showing you the relative sensitivity of the short, medium, and long wavelength cones in a person with normal color vision. This is showing you the range of the visible spectrum that they can perceive. And this shows you roughly what the color wheel would look like for this individual. This individual has a form of dichromatopsia, two color vision, called protonopsia. So you can see that they've lost the long wavelength photopigment. This results in a narrowing of the range of wavelengths that they're sensitive to, only up to about 625 instead of 660 or 670. But more importantly, it makes it really hard to know what wavelength you're looking at within this range here. Once you get outside of the range of sensitivity of the short wavelength cones, about 500 nanometers, out here, all wavelengths activate just the medium wavelength cones. And so how do you know whether you're seeing 550 nanometer wavelength light or 600 nanometer wavelength light? It's nearly impossible to tell. This shows you something like what this individual perceive if they saw full spectrum color wheel like this. You can see that as you go across the color wheel in this direction, from greens to reds, they look pretty much the same. It's very difficult to distinguish greens from reds. As you go across the color wheel in this direction, though, from yellows to blues, these individuals can distinguish that difference just fine, because that's going from medium wavelengths to short wavelengths. They have functioning photopigments and functioning cones, that allow them to figure out where they are between here and there. Let's talk a little bit about the genetics of color vision deficiency. You probably know that it's much more common in males than it is in females. 
Somewhere between 5 and 6% of the males in the U.S. have some form of color vision deficiency, so it's a very common disorder. Among females, though, it's much, much less common. The medium and long opsin genes, the ones that code for the protein part of the photopigments, are both on the X chromosome. Hopefully you remember that women have an XX chromosome pattern and men have an XY chromosome pattern for their sex chromosomes. So women essentially have a backup X chromosome in every cell in their body, including their photoreceptors in their retina. So if one X chromosome has a mutation that prevents them from producing a functioning medium wavelength photopigment, then they have a backup that probably doesn't have that mutation. Men, on the other hand, if they have a mutation on the X chromosome that prevents them from making a properly functioning medium or long wavelength photopigment, then they're out of luck. They don't have a backup. They have this Y chromosome, which does not contain these opsin genes. So as a result, they're much more likely to have a color vision deficiency. Women can have the same color vision deficiencies. They're just much, much more rare because a woman would have to have a mutation in the same gene on both chromosomes. Now, the color blindness we've been talking about is really color vision deficiency, difficulty discriminating certain wavelengths, but not complete color blindness. There is, however, a form of complete color blindness called complete achromatopsia. In this case, it's not a problem with the photopigment genes. Instead, none of the cones develop properly. It's exceedingly rare. A tiny fraction of a percent of the world's population has this disorder. Except on a little island called Pingalap. It's an atoll, kind of a ring-shaped island, in the Federated States of Micronesia. In 1775, a typhoon swept through and killed all but about 20 people on this island. There were probably only 1,000 to 2,000 people living on the island, but only 20 of them survived. One of the survivors of the typhoon, possibly the king, was a carrier for this autosomal recessive trait. Now, hopefully you remember that autosomal means that the gene is not on one of the sex chromosomes, and recessive means that you need two copies of the allele for this trait in order to see the trait. So the individual who carried this trait did not have complete achromatopsia. They were just a carrier. But today, 10% of the people on the island have complete achromatopsia, and another 30% are carriers. And this is much worse than just seeing things in black and white. Hopefully you remember that the cones are concentrated right around the fovea, right around your central vision. If the cones don't work there, you don't have other receptors to perceive that part of the visual field. So they essentially have reverse tunnel vision, where they can see in the periphery, but they can't see what they're directly looking at. They're functionally blind because of this. This type of effect is sometimes called the founder's effect, where the genes from a relatively small group of people form the basis for a larger population. It's also what you might call an evolutionary or genetic bottleneck. 